the Jesus way. Oh, the Jesus way. Is the way of peace. Is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way. Oh, the Jesus way. Is the way of peace. Is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. When He is King, all wars will cease. May His peace begin with me. When we went to South Sudan in January 2016, I was asked by many people. Why in the world do you want to go to South Sudan? Is it safe? Frankly, there's little reason to go to South Sudan, certainly at this time, unless you have friends and family and a relationship with people who are there. It is certainly a third world country and not a tourist destination in the usual sense. Hello, I'm Brent Carlson. Welcome to Brethren Voices. The truth of the matter is, we, the Church of the Brethren, do have a relationship with other Christians in South Sudan, and we have had for over 35 years. In 1979, during a hiatus of the Civil War that began in 1955, the Sudan Council of Churches approached the Church of the Brethren to ask if it would be possible to provide staff to implement a primary health care program as the Brethren had done in Nigeria. The World Ministry staff responded in the affirmative by recruiting Carolyn and Roger Schrock to execute the primary health care program in Upper Nile region province of the Sudan. In the annual conference in Seattle in 1979, the World Ministries Commission staff asked us if we'd be willing to consider going to Sudan because there had been an invitation came from the Sudan Council of Churches to the Church of the Brethren to do a similar program to the Lafia program that was in Nigeria. When we did the medical work in Nigeria, it was written up by the World Council, a World Health Organization, as one of the three viable models for Africa. And so the Sudan Council of Churches had seen that, was aware of that, and they came then requesting the Church of the Brethren to do a similar program in the southern part of Sudan, but without the institution. So basically starting uh, from scratch in a community-based uh, medical. So we were asked to go and work on the primary health care program of Western Upper Nile, which is a region in the southern part of Sudan. The Sudanese government asked that the Council of Churches base the program in Mayam with the responsibility of providing basic health services to 200,000 people living in 200,000 square miles. So on January 1980, I went back to, went to, to Sudan for the first time. Carolyn and the boys stayed in the States until I could go and find a place for us to live. Because the place that was assigned to the Church of the Brethren by the Sudan Council of Churches was a village called Mayum. And um, none of us from the Church of the Brethren had ever visited Mayum. And so the decision was made that it would be good for me to go on my own um, with the Sudan Council of Churches personnel to scope out the place and uh, see what's possible and make sure the arrangements are there so that we could live as a family. So I a staff of 28 people were recruited and trained to carry out the program. Most of these persons were based in Mayom, while a couple of the staff were based in Khartoum to provide logistics and supplies. It might be helpful to understand that <clears throat> when we went back in 1980, we were there from 80 to 84, uh, working on this primary health care program. And that was really an integrated rural development program in, in the Mayum Bentu area. Um, but because the Civil War broke out and became much, much more violent in uh, December of 1983, um, we had a Land Rover that was burned, for example, and um, we were basically s confined to the village of Mayum for some months. And our agreement was that if it was no longer safe for us, according to the chief, um, we would leave. And so one ma morning in May, he said, it's time for you to go. We left. We came back to the States. Well, in the late, or I mean, in the mid-1980s, when we were there, uh, before the sec this, that, that round of the war broke out, um, it was um, a bit difficult. It was frightening, in fact, 
uh, to be there and to hear about the fighting that was going on in other places, not right in our area, but around uh, some distance away, and uh, to um, be confined to your village and not being allowed to, to travel other places. Uh, the children had to stay close within the village and uh, that for quite an expended period of time that was difficult but at that time we learned to trust those that we were working with to know about the security and when we returned to South Sudan in whatever year that was 91. 1991 um, that's how you manage to be there and not be afraid, um, is to trust the people that you live with. The church leaders that we worked with, they had their nose to the ground, they had their ear to the ground, they knew about the battles. And uh, we did not have to concern ourselves about them other than to listen to them and their advice. You can't go that direction. There's fighting there. Don't go there. Um, even though we had been there a couple months before, now it's not safe to go there. So you learn to trust the people that you are working with to give you the good advice. In 1991, Roger and Carolyn moved to Tarit to serve the new Sudan Council of Churches with Roger as its first executive secretary and Carolyn as its director of communications. We had always been taught from the very initial stages that our job was to work ourselves out of a job. And so that was our role we understood as missionaries to go and train Africans to take over and, and then leave. Well, the second year we were in Mayum, one of the New Air elders came up to me and said, Roger, you're a great missionary. Well, you know, you feel really good. You have this inflated ego. And I said, well, thank, thank you, but uh, what, what do you mean? And he said, well, you came and you helped bring vaccine for our cows. You taught us how to do many different things. You brought us the stories of Jesus and how that completes our understanding of the, our religious traditions. But he said, can I ask you a question? Well, of course ask away. And he said, have you ever considered the possibility that God might have been here before you? And all of a sudden I realized that I had gone with a lot of my American cultural domination as a part of my experience. And so that had really was a transforming experience for me to begin to say, our role as missionaries is not to take the truth but our role as missionaries is to go and work among the people to discover what God is doing in that area. So that was a, a very transformative kind of experience for me. Not easy, but wonderful and I think an important learning for me. In 2009, Atanasis Ungang, a South Sudanese pastor, was hired by the Church of the Brethren to establish a presence in the Eastern Equatorial region. This resulted in the establishment of the Peace Center just outside Tarit. We met with Atanasis at the Peace Center in our recent visit to South Sudan. We left up him, it was uh, 96, then I left Uganda also, see. There we just communicating on the hair with him <laughs> until God brought him again <laughs> to South Sudan. Up to now, he's still alive. We, we can say we give thanks to Lord, yeah, although his family. As when he, he was in the U.S., I heard he prayed with the Brothering Church, mm -hmm. as we are the member of Brothering Church. So these are our elders. We should not leave him where he was. We have to follow him because he become like our father. So he a resourceful person to us. We should not leave him like this, but we know, I know for sure, everything I will get from him, a resourceful person. But anyway, for that, uh, as I told you that before that, 
you are highly welcome in La Fonte. This is the place where we were born. Uh, up to now, we still pray that let God bring his help. We have to pray for that. Because through the help of God, because for God nothing is possible to him. Uh, we have to pray that, let us pray that, let something come here as a miracle. We have built schools, we have worked with the Council of Churches and partnered with the African Inland Church as well as Reconcile for many years. We have supported refugees leaving and returning to the country. I'd like to share part of our visit with the Council of Churches and their director. We are practically at the big crossroad. We in South Sudan, uh, we have gone through a lot of challenges. Not taking a challenge on our faith, but challenges on this political situation that has destabilized us. Most of us are traumatized, even I feel the trauma in me. Uh, that what comes to my mind is only violence. Uh, I, I think violence is a solution, force is a solution. In the end, it's not that. But my faith in Jesus uh, helped me to say that it's not violence, uh, the solution to my problems of today in South Sudan and even in Sudan. Our brothers and sisters in Sudan are going through the same situation. We are going through the same situation. They thought, uh, we thought as Sudanese that dividing ourselves, okay, and Northerners be on their own, Southerners be on their own, was a solution. But technically, uh, the reality is not a solution. We are still at odds among ourselves, especially South Sudan. The joys of independence were washed down only two years after. Uh, the same guys who have been struggling for the faith of this country, offering their blood, their strength, their time sleeping under trees, being washed by rain, mm -hmm. turn their guns against each other. After, as I speak, they have signed some papers in Addis Ababa, uh, what they call compromise agreement. Uh, they have come in, they are still discussing. Instead of forming government of national unity, instead of starting out something to give peace a chance for the people of South Sudan, these are brothers and sisters in the government. For the past three years, we have had a representative in South Sudan working in the area of treat. Mr. Atsunasa Sungai, developing Peace and Trauma Healing Center, the only one of its kind in the country. South Sudan is a country in crisis, and we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering there and doing their best to rebuild a country ravaged by two civil wars over the last 60 years. South Sudan is about the size of Texas. The ravages of this war have left the infrastructure in tatters. It's hard to imagine a country in the modern age without running water, electricity, mail service, and only 80 miles of paved roads outside the capital of Juba. Go back in our history 150 years. Add a few motorcycles, jeeps, and a truck or two, and you have a picture of what life in the countryside is like. South Sudan is a country rich in history and resources. The official language is English, but they have 64 different tribal ethnic groups and 64 different languages. The civil wars have kept the resources from being developed and have sucked the resources and money out of the country and the lifeblood out of the people. The Sudanese were given their independence in 1955 from the British and the Egyptians. After getting their independence, a civil war started between the predominantly Muslim North and the traditional Christian South. In 2009, the South voted for and achieved its independence from the North and became the newest country in the world in 2011. They were led by a very good man, Dr. John Garang, who was then killed in a helicopter accident. The new government, upon his death, was led by the President Salva Kiir from the Dinka tribe and the Vice President Dr. Riak Machar 
from the Nuer tribe. Almost every family has lost members to the war. Out of 8 million people, some say 12 million, more than 2 million are internally displaced, not able to live in their home villages or tend their flocks and fields. Many are living in refugee camps operated by the UN or the South Sudanese government. In August 2015, a peace accord was reached between the president and the vice president. But the transitional coalition government was not actually formed until May 1, 2016. A true national peace has yet to be implemented so that the country can start rebuilding. Sixty years of civil war has prevented two generations of children from going to school and has created the lowest literacy rate of any country in the world. Less than half the people can read and write. The devastated infrastructure of dirt roads, water shortages, no electrical grid, scarce medicine, minimal medical treatment, and 150% inflation over the last year has left the economy slipping into a crisis. A school teacher last year made the equivalent of 55 US dollars per month. This year, that teacher only makes $22 a month, not enough to support oneself, let alone a family. South Sudan is also one of the most food challenged countries in Africa. Historically, the South Sudanese grew enough food to feed themselves. They count their livestock, cattle, sheep, and goats, and chickens as their wealth. They have a very productive growing season and in certain areas can even grow three crops a year of some vegetables. However, the civil war has left the government and rebel troops destroying villages, burning crops, killing civilians, and other those who can running for their lives and leaving everything behind. Hundreds of thousands are dependent on world food programs, the United Nations, and other NGOs for food and supplies. There is a very serious crisis going on right now because of a three-year drought all over Central Africa. When the rains did come last year, they came at the wrong time, and many areas lost 80% of their crops. Even the drought-resistant sorghum and cassava plants with edible leaves and roots suffered greatly. The normal growing season is April to September, and they harvest in October. Because the 2015 harvest was so low, they are running out of food this spring, 2016, and will not have enough food to last until they harvest again in October. In many places, this famine has driven adults to go from eating one meal one day to eating one meal every two days and now even one meal every three days. Healthy adults may be able to survive this way, but the sick, the children, and the babies cannot. As we travel through the country, the signs of malnutrition are not so obvious. 
But you can see from the very simple food they serve us, they do not have an abundance of food. What they shared with us resulted in them having less themselves. The people affected by this war and famine are struggling, struggling for their lives. There are more than two million people internally displaced, living in 10 internally displaced persons camps run by the UN and the government. Many of the camps have 40,000 or more people living in tents with no running water or electricity. We visited one close to Juba, the capital. Because of its proximity to the capital, it is one of the best run internally displaced camp camps in the country. We saw children in tents going to school, solar heated water tanks up on towers to give gravity flow to the water. And camp leaders told us they want peace so they can go home. But they need the help of the United States government to tell their leaders to help the people. We do agree that peace comes from God. But we must take it. God will not force it on us. I do not really agree that peace can come from white people. What we know of peace, we learned from Christ. A brown man. A brown man. Jesus was a brown man. Okay, yeah, 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 I'm good. I'm a lot. Also from Gandhi. He's from Gandhi. A brown man. Uh, and also from Dr. Martin Luther King. A black man. Uh, and also from Dr. Martin Luther King. If you wait, if you wait for white people to bring you peace, <laughs> you wait too long. We will remember this moment and, and we will do as much as we can to take your, your needs to our small church. I'll give you a blessing, blessing, the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and always. Amen. Amen. We visited three villages, Lafon, Pachidi, and Lohila. As we visited in the village of Pachidi, we walked by grinding rocks where women were grinding sorghum, family huts called tukuls, children playing soccer with a worn out soccer ball. Yeah. Unless if you stand from here, and then, you, then you could <coughs> some But they're doing it downhill up there, down lower. When we met with village leaders, they told us they needed disaster relief. I asked, what does that mean? And they told us, we need food. We are running out of food. In some villages, they are having to eat their livestock and seed grain. It's a very hard place to be. If you cannot feed the cows, the goats, the sheep, and the chickens will die. But if you eat them, you won't have them to breed anymore. But if you die of maltrition, there won't be anybody to tend the animals anyway. As we looked at the children, we saw signs of ill health and hunger, bloated bellies, reddish hair, weepy eyes. But they were happy to see us and excited when we showed them a video of themselves. When the group of six of us finished our visit in South Sudan, we met in Addis Ababa to discuss where we want to go from here and what we can do to help. We came up with several ideas, including sharing our experiences with others, in and out of the church, contacting our national congressional representatives and senators, and a personal challenge to match the money we spend on ourselves to eating out every month and sending it to the Global Food Crisis Fund run by the Church of the Brethren. 
The Church of the Brethren supports the South Sudanese Peace Center and several schools in several villages through the Global Missions Department. They are presently sending money to South Sudan for food and to our other African partners through the Global Food Crisis Fund. The Church of the Brethren supports the South Sudan Peace Center and schools in several villages through the Global Missions Department. They are also presently sending money for food to South Sudan and supporting our African partners through the Global Food Crisis Fund. And we're working on agriculture to introduce and encourage and assist using appropriate simple technologies to expand food production and storage like ox plowing, ferro cement granaries, and beekeeping. We are encouraging community cooperatives to help grow and market food crops and working with Heifer International to design programs and processes that will help the South Sudanese become more food secure. While watching this program, we want you to know that Christians around the world are included in the body of Christ. And you may recall the words of Jesus who said, when you do this for the least of these, you are doing it for me. Please do what you can to remember and keep our brothers and sisters in Christ in South Sudan and other places in your prayers. But we can also take action. Please do what you can to remember and keep our brothers and sisters in Christ in South Sudan and many other places in your prayers. Please also consider contributing to the Brethren Global Missions and Service Fund, the Nigerian Crisis Fund, and the Global Food Crisis Fund through www.brethren.org. For Brethren Voices, this is Brent Carlson, wishing you peace. All those who tread, all those who tread, the path he trod, the path he trod, all those who tread, all those who tread, the path he trod, the path he trod, all those who tread, the path he trod, shall be called the friends of God. May his peace begin with me. Oh, the Jesus way, is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way, is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. When he is king, all wars will cease. May his peace begin with.